Hi there, my name is uh, Carl Fredrickson, and I'm the publisher of Speedway Illustrated Magazine. And today I have the privilege of welcoming Ted Marsh into the Near Hall of Fame. As a journalist, it's my job to get the story right. And the best way to do so is in person. So I called Ted and asked if I could take him to dinner. Happily, he agreed, and I brought my notebook. I should have brought two notebooks. Fascinating story, this man we call Ted March, which actually should be pointed out, that isn't his name. You see, if you do media, journalism right, you have to start with the basics. So I said, okay, so it's Ted, T-E-D, Marsh, M-A-R-S-H. He said, yep, but that's not my name. He said, my name is Edward. My mother wanted me to be named Ted after a favorite uncle of hers. And she couldn't, so she just called him Ted anyway. And then he said, my father called me George. <laughs> I'm trying to process all this, and he says, my high school diploma says Theodore. <laughs> I I'm going to move on. Because otherwise, I'll slip into one of those old, you can call me Ray, or you can call me Jay, but you doesn't have to call me Johnson routines. If you're under 55, ask your grandparents. I don't know who I'm talking about. <laughs> Ted joined the Army in 58. His love for all things mechanical started to blossom into what would become a career as an engineer, eventually working for the Navy, primarily on submarines. And if you know something about engineers, they never leave well enough alone. For instance, Ted's MG was a 1950 TD model. You know the one. It's got the beautifully rolled fenders and the very small, tiny trunk. Right-hand drive, tiny two-seater. And that trunk space, by the way, would be very important when he married the lovely Linda in 1962. Before I go any further, she's here today. Ted and Linda, the love of each other's lives. Married 61 years, and I think that deserves a round of applause. It, it must have been a shaky start, though, because young Ted, the engineer, uh, provided quite the pain in her backside right out of the gate. You see, he installed a 1950s Ford rear-end housing in that MG, and always a matter of preparedness, he carried a spare axle. <laughs> And the only place it fit was behind Linda's seat. So the honeymooners sped off from their Connecticut home to Los Angeles in the little car, carrying a single suitcase and three axles. <laughs> Imagine Linda's 3,000-mile journey with every bump, dip, and pothole providing a stern reminder of just who she married. Just outside Flagstaff, Arizona, Linda's the one who noticed that the oil pressure was dropping in the car. So Ted found a gas station that was attached to a Chevrolet dealership, and he persuaded the general manager to come out and take a look at his car. The general manager came out and he said, son, you got your alphabet all mixed up. That there's an MG and this here's GM. And that's when Ted wandered over lifted the hood, and revealed that he had snuck a small-block Chevrolet engine in that <laughs> MG, too. <laughs> the manager let Ted have a bay and fix his car. It took a week. He said, all together, the honeymoon lasted six weeks, but I think they're still on it. <laughs> and that axle, well, it came in handy on a deserted Ohio highway on their way home. But like so many others, Ted's enthusiasm for engineering drew him to the racetrack. He marveled at the flimky, the flimky front end. Equally legendary chassis builder Maynard Troyer started Marsh's designs. Marsh built a stock car like that MG that was right-hand drive so he could put more weight on the left. And running that car in 1970, he and crew member Guy Barger took their regular spot on the truck's bed to watch the first of 25 lap features. And at the conclusion, they grabbed a couple of hot dogs from the concession stand and they they ate in what we call, you know, racer fine dining, huddled over a trash can. That's when the commotion broke out because their driver, Billy Harmon, was waiting for him in victory lane. 
It was their first. It was Ted's first victory as a car owner. Many drivers turned Marsh's wheels. They include Ken Bouchard, Ted Christopher, Steve Park, Andy Santier, Ryan Priest, and Ricky Fuller, who, Fuller, who earned the lone championship in 1985 at Waterford. Marsh's motivation, though, wasn't championships, and while he had many wins, it wasn't those either. He loved to see his car move through the field. He saw it as his job to provide a car capable of doing so to a driver who was equally capable of doing so. He told me I never wanted a driver who worked on the car because he'd be afraid of tearing it up. I like aggression, so I never minded if it got wrecked, unless it was deliberate. Wait a minute, did you just tell me you had Ted Christopher driving for you? <laughs> he said, yeah, TC would get in trouble with me for hitting other cars for no reason. But the idea was having an opportunity to build something that he created and having fun at the racetrack. And those drivers who I spoke with echoed those words. Steve Park said, I thoroughly enjoyed driving for him. I can't think of a better person to go in the near Hall of Fame. Ted represented the Northeast in the best way possible. He always made sure we were competitive, having fun, and enjoying ourselves. The way he treats his crew and drivers are first class. Another driver, Ryan Priest, told me, he was the level-headed car owner with the quiet confidence who never got rattled. He carried the biggest smile and the biggest margarita I've ever seen. <laughs> Such a reputation netted quite a few resumes for Ted Marsh, too. And during dinner, he casually mentioned something to me that I found remarkable. He said, I never threw a resume away. How could I? That's a person's whole life on that piece of paper. The gravity of such words caused that table to grow quiet and maybe a bit reflective because he spoke about the only race he was determined to win. He and Andy Santier agreed to run the September 2000 Bush North race at New Hampshire. The Santiers, Andy and Sue, had a friend, Beth Wright, who was bravely fighting cancer and they wanted to honor her. Sue Santier organized a fundraiser around the car and placed an image of this brave woman on the hood. Her close family and friends gathered at the racetrack in the team's pit area before the big race. Some of them didn't know that she had already passed away just two days before. I told Andy, we have to win this race. We just have to. And we did. And in true Ted Marsh fashion, he said, but it was all Andy, of course. And he said, the rewards in racing a seeing your car go, and the friendships made along the way. You got a room for him here, Ted, or whatever your name is. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Marsh. You made a lot of that up, didn't you? <laughs> yeah, everywhere. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, today's a great day for me. Really honored. Uh, Ricky, how are you? Good to see you. <laughs> um, my whole family's here. All my kids, my wife, all my grandkids are here. <laughs> and a lot of my past employees are here. They're all sitting over in the back over there, uh, close to the bar, naturally. <laughs> and even some of my other old drivers are here. Kenny B., <laughs> Ricky Fuller. <laughs> no Dickie Castle, though. <laughs> and no Jerry Dosti. Unfortunately, I lost him, but... Anyway, um, I started in the si mid-60s. Uh, a kid down the street from me started building a car in the middle of winter with no garage outside. And I would drive by and see this kid, and it's unbelievable. How, how could he do this? But he did it. And he got the car done for Waterford. He ran it as a bomber. And I remember going over there and trying to help him. But I had Linda with me, and we weren't allowed to go in the pits with, with a lady. So we had, we had a meeting at the fence after practice, after the heat races and so forth. And I try to give him advice as best I could from just watching the car. But anyway, um, it was a lot of fun in those days. And uh, I can remember at Waterford in the bomber days, I, there, was, there was two idols there that I had, Art Berry and Bob Gabarino. Those two guys were beautiful cars, the, the best. And I used to marvel at their cars and, and the way they ran their businesses. So... Uh, it, it's amazing. It's been a, it's been a long ride, but uh, along about mid ninety, um, 
I was walking through the Waterford pits. I wasn't running the modified because Stafford threw us out in 85, or the end of 85. <laughs> they wanted all SKs or something, so we left and just ran special shows. But I was walking through the pit area, and Teddy Christopher yelled at me. And he says, hey, he says, I bought a bush car. I want you to look at it. Okay, bring it to my shop. So he did, and it was something, I, a piece of work. Two-by-two two frame, I mean, really a legal car. But we converted it and made it a legal Bush North car, and it's back in the V6 days. So I don't know if we ever finished a race with the thing. The motors would blow up almost every time. It was terrible. But anyway, around about 96, uh, one of my guys, one of my first full-time employees is here, helped me build a 96 car for TC, and we ran it at uh, New Hampshire and won with it. That's Roger Tryon sitting right down here. <laughs> anyway, it was uh, from there on, it was more races. And finally, I had a, a marketing guy that worked with me named Brad Wheeler, who was another engineer from the Navy. But this guy thought outside the box on everything. I've never seen anything like it. So we decided we'd go to Wheeling and see if we could round up some money to help us. At the time, we had Less Care Kitchens sponsoring Teddy, and they were terrible to deal with. They were really tough. So anyway, we, really tough. <laughs> we went to Wheeling and walked in the CEO's office and sat down, and he never looked up. He said, if you guys are here for money, you've come to the wrong place. And I'm ready to say, thank you, John, and get up and leave. Now, Brad, he says, we're not here for money. We're here to borrow your airplane. <laughs> J John put his pen down. He said, what? He said, yeah, he says, we've got these executives that run this uh, kitchen company, and they don't like to drive long distances, and they don't want to drive to Watkins Glen. So we wondered if we could talk you into uh, flying the people up there for us. And John liked things like that, so he agreed to it. So we put his name on the car, <coughs> and along with Las Care Kitchens. And just before the, the, uh, we were to leave up there, Brad called me up. He had another idea. He said... Uh, the in-car camera folks had called them, and they have an in-car camera available for that race for $7,500. Would, would we be willing to do it? So I said Brad, to Brad, I said, well, you call Lesker and see if they'll split it, and we'll try wheeling and see if they'll take the other half. So we did that. And the other in-car camera was, I think, Brian Wall. Is that right, Brian Wall? He had an in-car camera, and uh, unfortunately, he, he blew up on the first lap, so he was out. But uh, Teddy started third. This is at Watkins Glen. And he went to shift from second to third, and the transmission locked up between the two gears. So he went from third to 28th or 29th before he finally got it straightened out and got going again. And uh, away he went. And the whole TV show was Teddy Christopher in the car and watching him saw his way through that field. And we won the race. But the, the best part was there was a yellow, it was, I don't know, midway through the race. And Benny Parsons was the was the commentator, and he got on the on the radio talking to Teddy, and he says, "So Teddy, how are things going?" Like the, Teddy says, "They got the camera right on him," and Teddy says, "I'm a little busy right now. I can't talk." And he's just sitting there. <laughs> <laughs> Typical TC. He just didn't want to talk to him. So. <laughs> anyway, um, we did that and and ran some Bush races, and finally got a Bush South car with uh, Steve Park driving it, and uh, we went when we went to go down south with that. Um, Steve, Steve was already driving for Dale Earnhardt. He was driving the number one Pennzoil car. So uh, when, he, when he went to Dale to say he wanted to run a Bush car on Saturday, he told him what car, and Dale said, they ain't going to use that number, are they? <laughs> we had the 13 on the car. So Dale said, they can use my number. Have them, have them use my number. So I called NASCAR, and I said, uh, Dale's number for the Bush series was 31. So I said, we, we'd like to get 31. Dale said we could have it. Of course, NASCAR says, they don't make those decisions. <laughs> Dale doesn't make those decisions. <laughs> okay. So I call, called Steve back. And I said, NASCAR called and said, sorry, Dale doesn't make those decisions. Steve said, oh, okay. He went into Dale. Half hour later, I got a phone call from NASCAR. He got the 31. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, we ran that until Steve got really hurt badly at Darlington. Uh, had, a, had a rain delay, and during the rain delay, he got out of the car, used the facilities, and then when he got back in the car, he never latched the steering wheel. And uh, 
riding around under the yellow, making sure the track was dry, was no problem. I mean, you know, he, he wasn't scuffing tires or doing anything, so the steering wheel stayed on. But as soon as they gave the one to go sign, they really started honking on the steering wheel to get the tires cleaned off. Here comes A.J. Foyt's son from the back. They used to line up single file in those days. And the leap down, lap down cars came up on the inside. And that's the only way you could get your lap back. They didn't have a, a lucky dog deal. But uh, Steve was just cranking on the wheel coming off, too, when the steering wheel came off. And he got T-boned by, by Larry Foyt. And uh, it, Steve was in severe condition, bad, bad concussion. And, and we were worried for a while. I mean, I was in the hospital with him. It was touch and go, you know, really touch and go. But he came back, and he actually came back and tried to drive again for us in 06. So that was basically five years later. And uh, he tried, but he still wasn't 100%. And he did finally come back and race some, but it's, you know, Unfortunately, I think we ruined his career, but you know, that's racing is like that, does that kind of thing. But anyway, um, along about the same time, Mr. Whelan, Sonny Whelan, who owns Whelan, I had never even met him in my life, and even and he lived in the next town for me his whole life. But um, as uh, we had a media day, the Bush North Series had a media day at Lime Rock, and Teddy Christopher was driving for us. And Whalen was already sponsoring us with the airplane deal. And uh, so I called, I mean, Brad called Sonny Whelan, right? this marketing guy of mine, called Sonny Whelan and said, how about coming up to meet the team? So I said, oh, yeah. Yeah, so he came up. He's a really nice guy. So he came up, met all of us, and went through the truck, met Teddy, and then uh, it was starting to say goodbye. And then uh, they announced that the media guys were all getting rides. Uh, with with professionals down on the down on the grid, so we sent Sonny down there, and uh, they put him in a Viper with a pro driver, and and they told him if you like it, keep your thumbs up. If you want to come in, put your thumbs down. He sat there the entire time with his thumbs up, never put him down. So they ran about ten laps with him, and the guy went as hard as he could. And Sonny left there, and uh, within six months he owned a Viper, brand new one. And a few months later, I heard. He was running gym connas and parking lots and that kind of thing. So I wasn't too, too worried. But then I heard he was going to mid-Ohio. And when I heard that, I got worried. I mean, this thing has no roll cage, no nothing. So uh, I, I finally called him myself. And I said, Sonny, look, if you're going to race a car, why don't you find an older Viper that's been built, buy it, and we'll redo it for you. So that's what he did. And uh, that Sonny started racing. That was 2001 or so. And... He raced right up until Parkinson's got the best of him, but and he's still involved in racing, you know, as everybody knows in just about every division there is. But um, that's that's my story, and, and I kind of hang with Sonny now. We still we still do some uh, uh, road race stuff with, when we can, when, when people have stuff they want us to do. But other than that, I see Ricky every now and then down south. First time I've seen him up north in a long time. <laughs> Anyway, thank you very much. I appreciate it very much.